Next, on Images Imágenes, the practice of senatorial courtesy. Is it another form of discrimination? Saludos. Welcome to Images Imágenes. I'm Miguel Perez. For about six months this year, former judge Marianne Espinosa Murphy had to endure tremendous vilification, denied her renomination for tenure as a Morris County judge through a custom called senatorial courtesy and forced by her own principles to remain silent while the public was told that she lacks the demeanor and temperament to be a good judge. But today, we get an opportunity to judge for ourselves. We get to see that demeanor and temperament of this Latina because Judge Spinoza Murphy is here to speak to us today on her own, on her own defense, not just about her case, but the trying time she has endured. But what about this practice of senatorial courtesy, which allows a senator to block gubernatorial nominations of people from that senator's own county, when Morris County Republican Senator John Dorsey took action to finish her judicial career, Judge Espinosa Murphy may have seen it as senatorial discourtesy. But perhaps now she feels vindicated because on November 2nd, Senator Dorsey lost his bid for re-election. Welcome to the program, Judge Murphy. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank Do you, you feel vindicated? Well, actually, um, I feel as though this was an example of the government and the democracy that we all believe in working. And in that sense, I feel vindicated that my belief in the Constitution and the principles that it creates for all of us, which we all love, uh, was vindicated. Well, your case, senatorial courtesy, but your case in particular became an issue mm. in this campaign. Yes, and it was. And perhaps this is the reason why Senator Dorsey lost. Uh, how, how big an issue was it in that particular district? Well, I think it was a significant issue because it, it touched the heart uh, of everybody in the district. I think people have a very basic sense of what is fair and what is not fair, and it hit home with a lot of people that this was something that was unfair. It caught their attention, and then they looked further, um, and they saw that this particular exercise of courtesy was something that was consistent rather than inconsistent with the way that Senator Dorsey uh, chose to represent his constituents. And they also saw that uh, Gordon McInnes was a really good alternative to that kind of practice. What is Mr. McInnes's position? He's the person who was elected, the Democrat who was elected to that Senate seat, but what has been his position on senatorial courtesy? Well, he has said that once elected, he will take, um, uh, he will make efforts to um, do away with senatorial courtesy within the context of judicial reappointments. I think that it would be extremely difficult to do away with senatorial courtesy across the board because that's something that's very popular with the senators. But I think that at the time is ripe and um, McInnes has said that he will do what's necessary to try to get that passed. Well, let's start with your case and let's start from the beginning if we may. You remained silent, as I mentioned in the introduction, for quite a long time during this whole controversy. The whole summer, everybody in the media was trying to get you to talk about right. this. <laughs> and now you're openly uh, speaking to me and to other reporters about this issue. Why, uh, first of all, why did you remain silent for so long? And why are you speaking now? Well, I felt it was appropriate for me to remain silent um, because, first of all, I was a judge at the time. I was on the bench, and judges are not uh, permitted to speak publicly on uh, issues like this. And there was a political process that was going on. It would have been very inappropriate for me to be involved in that. So to a, a certain extent, because of the position that I held and the way I felt about the position, I was a sitting duck. I was uh, a defenseless target for the kind of things that uh, Senator Dorsey was saying about me. But since that time, since I came off the bench, I felt that the issue was one which was terribly important for the public to be informed about and for me to do what I could within the limits of my abilities to see to it that it came to an end. When you uh, speak about sitting duck, when you were uh, playing the role of a sitting duck, unfortunately, how did you feel? In other words, how did this affect you personally? 
Well, it was tough, but perhaps not as tough as you think. Um, first of all, um, I had the support of an extraordinary number of people all across the board. I had um, the support of everyone that I respect in the legal profession, all the prior governors of the state of New Jersey, the Chief Justice, Governor Florio, uh, the former Attorneys General, and even more exciting than that was the reaction of everyday people who would come up to me in the street and just touch my elbow and say, I'm on your side, hang in there, and who really recognized the unfairness of what I was being subjected to. So there was a great deal of support, and I also have a lot of strength from uh, experiences that I've had within my family and uh, the kind of people who raised me, who well, raised me to be a strong person. That was going to be my next question, <laughs> uh, the kind of people who raised you. You're a Latina. Right. Uh, I understand your father was from Nicaragua right. and your mother from, from Spain. S from Spain. From uh, but you did not grow up in a Hispanic uh, community no. or, or you don't have that, that uh, ethnic background. Uh, well, you do, but you don't, because well, you didn't grow up in such an environment. Right, exactly. I remember one of my earliest recollections is having to explain to my classmates where Nicaragua was, mm -hmm. because they never heard of Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. You know, they heard of maybe Mexico, maybe Spain, but they really had no familiarity with Spanish customs, Spanish history, Spanish culture. And so I was um, uh, put in a position of having to speak on behalf I was the representative of Spanish culture in my town, uh, and that was, uh, you know, sometimes a little daunting, but I, Where I was, was exciting. This? Where did you grow up? I grew up on Long Island, mm -hmm. on a little shore on the a little town on the south shore of Long Island, near Jones Beach. Okay, now going back to the Hispanic community, when they knew that you were Hispanic, what kind of support did you get during this summer from the Hispanic community and also from women? It was fabulous. It was really fabulous. Um, you know, I think that I made friends with people. Um, I think that sometimes friendships are meant to be. And I uh, developed friendships with people through this experience, people who were committed to seeing it through that were uh, very exciting for me. Um, and I think that, frankly, that the Hispanic community was very important in uh, getting John Dorsey defeated, because I know that there were mobilized efforts uh, made in Morristown and in Dover, um, because they were upset at having somebody with uh, Hispanic identity being uh, taken off the bench. Did this whole controversy help you create a closer bond with the Hispanic community? Oh, certainly. Certainly. Um, you know, part of the, the experience that I've had as a judge has been one in which, and my prior service, which was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, was such that I was kept apart from any kind of political process. I was not permitted mm -hmm. to be involved in that sort of thing. So essentially, I have been involved in my career and being a mother. And I had no political activism at all. So this was a new door that was opened for me. And I think that the door will be open for a while. And talk it will about, stay open as far as I'm concerned. doors opening. Yeah. You represent two uh, of the groups that are grossly underrepresented in the judicial system, mm -hmm. women and Hispanics. And I'm wondering whether you think that the Republicans, Mr. Dorsey and others who opposed you, had that in mind? Was it a form of discrimination because you were a woman and Hispanic? Uh, what was going on during this summer? Uh, well, I don't think that there was a, a conscious effort to discriminate against me because I was Hispanic or because I was a woman. I think that there was an insensitivity to what the circumstances were, what the consequences were for allowing one senator to do this to one woman Hispanic judge. Um, when the Republican Senate caucus met on August 16th to decide whether they were going to strip Senator Dorsey of courtesy and mm -hmm. allow me to have a fair hearing, or if they were going to stand by their man, which is what they ultimately decided to do, there wasn't a single woman or Hispanic in that caucus. They were all white males. And I think that it's, that says a lot. Uh, it says a lot, and I think that it's um, easy to understand that if you are part of the group that has traditionally held power, that perhaps you are not going to be very sensitive to the consequences for those people who have traditionally been excluded from that power system and how much it means 
to women and to Hispanics to see one of their own in a position of authority. Um, you probably had the same experience as I did growing up in terms of if there was anybody on TV who was Spanish, my father called everybody into the room. We all had to watch everything that was going on. When the, the Spanish pavilion opened at the World's Fair, my relatives came from all over the country. This was, we never ate out in restaurants, but we were going to eat there. We were going to compare the gazpacho there to the kind we made at home. And it was something that was, meant an awful lot to us. Now, if you are part of the establishment, you know, this is just one person more or less. And perhaps it doesn't mean as much. Am I right in saying that women and Hispanics are grossly underrepresented in ju the judicial system? Yes. What kind of a problem do we have in this state as far as minority judges? Well, I think that there's a sensitivity that there have to be more. Um, at least that was the, uh, true under Governor Florio. Um, and, you know, of course, Mrs. Whitman isn't in office yet, so we'll have to see what her track record is going to be. But um, under Governor, things have been getting better, um, particularly for women. Governor Florio had appointed more women to the bench in his four years than any other governor previously had done in eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to him, Governor Kane had appointed and reappointed more women than the, the governors who preceded him. So I think that there's a greater sensitivity, and I, I'm hoping that things are going to continue to improve. Uh, let's get back to Senator Dorsey and what he said about you. He said that you lack the temperament mm -hmm. uh, to be a good judge. Mm -hmm. Does he have any basis for saying that? What does he base himself on? We'll never know because he never um, made public, we never had a hearing at which whatever it was he was relying upon could be made public. Now he was given access to, unlimited access to tape recordings of the proceedings that uh, occurred in my courtroom mm -hmm. um, for the entire time that I was on the bench and he did in fact request a number of tape recordings and supposedly reviewed them and after reviewing them admitted that he could not prove his charges at a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Certainly there were people who complained, uh, particularly the last two years I was in family court. Um, that's a very wrenching part of the court to be involved in. We have to be involved with families who are broken, who can't uh, solve their own problems, and you know, quite often are rather dissatisfied with the results uh, that happen in court because we have to make decisions for people that are very personal in nature. So I'm sure that there were some complaints there. And did you find yourself uh, in a position of having to lecture somebody because he had abuse, uh, his wife, or uh, this kind of situation? Well, what I did as a judge was I tried to temper my response <clears throat> to what I thought the needs of the people were and how to best get them to a point where they would hopefully be able to start solving their problems. Sometimes people in family court lose it intellectually. Their emotions take over because the stakes are so high personally mm -hmm. and sometimes it helps to speak to someone very patiently very kindly to try to get them to feel that someone understands and we can try to walk you through. But sometimes you have to speak sharply to people um, because you feel that that's what's going to trigger the response that you want. So yes, I did speak sharply to people and um, one group that was very vocal about me was um, the group of uh, non-custodial parents who have taken a militant position against paying child support. Mm -hmm. They don't like me very much at all. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't like them very much either, <laughs> so it's okay. Um, uh, Judge Murphy, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what you wanted really was an opportunity to get your own hearing. That's right. Uh, I remember when I met you at, at a press conference, uh, you told me that an axe murder even an axe murderer gets a, he a hearing. That's and, right. And you as a judge were not getting that hearing for your chance at renomination. Is that, isn't that basically what you were asking for? That's all I asked for. That was it. Um, you and know, under this senatorial uh, uh, courtesy practice, you, you're not allowed that hearing? What happens is when the governor makes the nomination, there's a little slip of paper that goes over to the mailboxes of the senators who represent the county in which the nominee resides. Mm -hmm. Um, for, it doesn't have to be the senator of the person nominated. For example, Senator Dorsey was not my senator. 
he represented another part of the county. Um, and then that person signs off on the nomination, actually signs their name. And once they sign their name, then in the case of a judge, the nomination then goes to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The Senate Judiciary Committee has a hearing. It's public. Anybody can come and listen. Anybody can come and speak to the committee about their concerns or experiences with a judge. The Senate Judiciary Committee then votes, and uh, they have to vote one way or the other, and then it goes to the full Senate for a vote. When a senator refuses to sign off, it ends at the senator's mailbox, and it never goes further, and there's never another hearing. Even though there have been um, evaluations made of the judge prior to that time, or prior to the time that the governor ever um, chooses to nominate or not to nominate. So that's what happens. Now, I, I don't know that that is something that we have to worry about with, with judicial reappointments anymore, but that's certainly the process with every gubernatorial nomination. Now, your husband is active in the Democratic Party. Well, no. Uh, he I've has been talk, in the past. I've heard talk that uh, what Mr. Dorsey was doing is retaliating not against you, but against your husband. Mm -hmm. is, that, is there any truth to that? Well, you know, you hear rumors. You hear a lot of rumors. Um, and I suppose we would never know. We'll just never know since we never got to see what information he was relying upon. Um, I hate to speculate. I don't know that it's fair to Senator Dorsey to speculate about um, possi possible motives that would have been in bad faith. Um, you know, that part of it is over. We'll never be able to test his proofs. Did this whole thing catch you by surprise? I mean, when he invoked senatorial courtesy, did you see this coming from Senator Dorsey? Or were you expecting some problem from him? Uh, well, in the initial letter that he sent, in which he um, responded to my letter and indicated that he was not going to support me, he made reference to statements that he had made in the past uh, to uh, a friend of his who was a friend of my husband's, uh, in which he indicated he wasn't going to support me. So it wasn't completely a surprise. Um, I'd have to say that those kinds of rumors that got to me before his letter uh, would support the speculation that you asked me about. What, what, uh, what kind of a message, I wonder, uh, does this send out to the judicial system, to other judges in the state of New Jersey, as to uh, you know, the power that one single senator has over them? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that before Election Day, it, uh, it broadcast a terrible message. And I heard about it from many judges who were really, frankly, fearful of what would happen if this became a more routine practice. Um, but I think that with Senator Dorsey's defeat on November 2nd, that this will never happen again. Because he lost in Morris County, which is heavily Republican, which gave a 40,000 vote margin to uh, Mrs. Whitman. He uh, had won very handily in that district before, and he lost to a Democrat. So I don't think that uh, anybody else will risk doing this unless they're willing to give up their political career. Uh, senatorial practice, um, are you objecting to it in general, or do you think only in terms of, it should be banned only in terms of reappointment of judges? Is that where you only see the conflict, or do you think the whole practice should be done away with? Well, I have limited my um, position to the judicial reappointment context, because that's what I know about. Mm -hmm. I'm not a political person. I am not well versed in politics at all. Um, and I know that there are many cogent arguments made on behalf of senatorial courtesy and also opposed to senatorial courtesy. It may very well be that um, it would be responsible at this point to take a good hard look at the practice to see where it results in abuse, where it results in better government, um, and uh, see if there, it's time to reform it. But I don't have an opinion because my experience is limited to the one context, and uh, I think that uh, that's where I should stay, where I know what I'm talking about. I think I asked this question before, but I'd like you to talk a little more about how this whole thing affected you personally. Did it create a certain sadness, a certain dissolution with the mm -hmm. system? Uh, 
Uh, did you feel like, well, you know, it's not worth being a judge anymore? How did you feel personally inside? Okay. Well, it was a roller coaster. You know, there were ups and there were downs. There were things about this which um, buttressed my faith in the system, in the Constitution, in the people, in democracy, and there were things that were very disappointing to me as well. Um, so there was kind of a mixed, very mixed experience. I felt throughout that I had an obligation as a person who had taken an oath to support the Constitution, as a person who had uh, had the privilege of being a judge to do my part not to participate in any kind of practice that was going to lessen what it meant to be a judge. And that's why, essentially, I rejected the offer of staying for seven years without tenure, because I felt that if I were to agree to this, it would be a terrible precedent. It would be opening the door for other judges down the line to be placed in that same terrible position. I had the privilege, the luxury, of um, being able to say, no, thank you. Um, I, I will only be the kind of judge that I swore I would be, an independent judge, a judge who was not um, dependent upon the political winds in order to keep her job. Um, I don't think that anyone should cling to something that they love so much that the thing loses its essential character. Um, you know, sometimes you have to love something so much that you have to be willing to let it go in order to preserve it. And that's how I felt about, <clears throat> about this whole procedure. And now that Senator Dorsey lost and you still love uh, the <laughs> position so much, uh, would you be willing to accept another nomination? Well, that's a, that's a tough question because, um, you know, no one has uh, called me up and said, uh, I'm nominating you at this point. I loved being a judge. I would certainly never rule out the possibility of going back on the bench, but it just may be something, that, it's something that's not within my control at this point. Well, maybe come January and there's a few new faces in Trenton, uh, something will happen. Uh, one of the <coughs> things that you did during the campaign is that you did go out and endorse some of the Democratic senators who were campaigning against senatorial courtesy. Yes. Uh, why did you do that? Uh, for, ha for someone who was silent all this time, then you came out on the campaign trail. That's right. Well, that was, I'll tell you, that was a major break for me. In order to get involved in uh, my feeling, my vision was that I had to keep this, vis this issue pure and in the public's mind to the best of my ability. And to do that, I had to overcome two aversions that I have. One is to politics, and the other is to getting my picture taken. And I had to get over <laughs> that one big time. So um, I had to, you know, it was a, just something you had to do. You had to do in order to um, try to keep it alive. And um, it, fortunately, there were a number of people who were running for office who were willing to take a stand. And I think it was a courageous one. Um, some of them came close to winning, some of them did not come at all, and some of them did win. You had said that you would not accept another nomination until, or consider another nomination until after Election Day. When Election Day came and went, mm -hmm. and the Florio who supported you is no longer there. Mm -hmm. So uh, what does this mean in terms of uh, your chances of going back? What are you, how do you foresee your future? Are you going back into law practice, or are you going to be a judge again? Well, um, I think one of the things you have to recognize is what do you have control over and what do you not have control over. Mm -hmm. um, and I do not have control over whether someone nominates me or does not nominate me. What I do have control over is what am I going to do? Who has the power to nominate you? The governor. So it would be up to Governor Whitman to nominate you? Governor Whitman or if she agreed to allow Governor Florio nominate me at that, this time, that could happen. But that's something that I don't have any, not, neither, not only do I not have any control over, but not being a political person, I really am quite distant from all those kinds of decisions. So what I'm going to do now is um, decide basically on which law firm I'm going to go with because that's the next logical step, is to um, get back involved in law. That's what I know, uh, and I like it. You were recently honored by the Hispanic Bar Association. Yes. How does that feel? It was wonderful. It was a great evening, and um, it, it meant a lot to me personally. I only wish my parents could have been here to see this, because I know they would have been terribly proud. Mm. Well, I think that when you are uh, a judge again, uh, let's be optimistic. <laughs> Uh, you can come up back on images, imágenes, and talk about the judicial system because I'm sure there's a lot of other issues 
uh, that we'd like to discuss with you, uh, especially regarding the Hispanic community, how we Hispanics are dealt with in the judicial system, mm -hmm. and one of some of the problems that you see from the bench looking in the other direction. Mm -hmm. and, and if you could take one second, uh, tell us about some of, the, some of your impressions about you know, dealing with Hispanics from mm -hmm. the bench. Well, I think one of the biggest problems is the lack of support systems um, that can deal with people in the Spanish language. There's no question in my mind. In fact, I recently agreed to be part of a, um, a team at Morristown Memorial Hospital to see how the services that are provided by the hospital could better serve the Hispanic community. Um, it was a tremendously frustrating thing for me to see that when I was um, ordering people to do certain things, people who were limited by not being able to spe speak English definitely were at a tremendous disadvantage and were not being provided the same services that uh, English-speaking spe people were. And sometimes so, the translation is not all as good as it should be. Well, we were very lucky in Morris Town. We had um, a very good Spanish interpreters, and it was kind of fun for me to be able to listen in and, you know, sometimes uh, if we didn't have an interpreter to do a little bit of it myself. But um, we definitely need a lot of help in that regard to see to it that Spanish people get the same benefits as everybody else when they're going th not just through the court system but through the supplementary services. That's another program altogether and we hope you come back to do that. Thank you very much for being Thank here. You. We really yeah. enjoyed it. In the meantime, we like you, we like to know how you think. What do you think about senatorial courtesy? Please write us at Images Imagines, New Jersey Network, 50 Park Place, Newark, New Jersey, 07102. Let us know how you feel about this program. Believe me, your letters are important so that we can continue presenting you the images, those beautiful imágenes of the Hispanic community. That's Images Imágenes, New, York, uh, New Jersey Network, 50 Park Place, Newark, New Jersey, 07102. And I'm Miguel Perez, and I hope to see you next week in another edition of Images Imágenes. Hasta pronto. <laughs>